and welcome to the Financial Wake Up Show. Each week, we explore and take a deep dive into awakening the financial abundance we all have inside of us. We educate and create awareness by focusing on fundamental principles of money, talking to business and community leaders about successful habits, while learning from each other how to build, protect, and create legacies. And now, here's your host, Daniel Choi. And good morning. It's a new day, and with each day comes a new beginning, a new chance to do something great, learn something new, and enjoy everything this great life has to offer. If you haven't already done so, go to iTunes or Google Play, subscribe to the podcast. Also, I know a lot of you have already done that. Please rate the show, leave a review. Uh, You can give that feedback there. You can also download not only the shows on the your iPhone or on your desktop, you can subscribe to the show on YouTube as well. Find all of this under the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi. I am broadcasting again on KCAA 1050 AM 106.5 FM. I combine integrity with intelligence to wake you up to things you want to be doing financially. Check out our website, financialwakeupshow.com, or visit us on Facebook and Twitter. That's at TFWS. If you have any doubt, just reach out. And on every show, we talk about three things. Growing and protecting your wealth. Exit planning is second, which is selling or transferring your business if you're a business owner or retirement if you're an employee. And finally, estate planning, which is creating a legacy while fully enjoying your money while you're alive. And this week, uh, I wrote an article for Forbes Uh, called Why You Don't Need a Needs-Based Analysis. And I don't want to get into too much of the details of the article itself. If you want to read it, uh, go to the website and click on the links to my Forbes articles. Or, of course, you could just go to Forbes.com and search under Daniel Choi. You'll find the article there. But one of the things I talked about is how there's an outdated philosophy in the financial planning space where we seem to try to predict what's going to happen. And it's virtually impossible to do that. Uh, A lot of clients I meet, I ask them, when do you want to retire? And a pretty common question I hear, I mean, the answer to that question I hear is, I don't know when I want to retire. I like work. Uh, Even clients who thought they would retire earlier uh, end up wanting to stay engaged uh, while some others want to retire tomorrow. And so how do we know what the future holds? We don't. And a lot of times we assume everything's going to go right. And that's a big assumption that often falls flat on its face. Things don't always go to plan. And it's something we do have to consider. Now, um, one of these things that I think is going to impact us and hit us very hard is the cost of health care. Uh, We hear about it in the news a lot. Uh, I've talked about health insurance on a past episode with Greg Hack. But um, today what I want to talk about is this problem we have of planning for the rising cost of health care. People are living longer. We have the baby boomers who are moving into ages where health starts to deteriorate quickly. And it's something I want to address today. In fact, I'm going to switch the format of the show a little bit. And uh, I have a long interview with somebody who's going to drop some knowledge on what's going on with healthcare. Really mind blowing stuff, to be frank. So, this week's Wake Up Now segment is what do I need to do from a planning perspective to account for the rising care, uh, cost of healthcare? And I say this because in the article, I I mentioned that we don't know the future. And a lot of times things not only don't go to plan, they don't go right. Sometimes things go wrong. And everybody has this false sense of security through some of the financial plans they've made. You have to account for what if things don't go right. And health is one of those things you can't... uh, ignore or disregard you know if i have a dream of buying a vacation home in the mountains one day and let's say worse comes to worse i can't afford that or it doesn't come to fruition yeah, i could survive but if all of a sudden i have an illness that could last for several years 
uh, I'm no longer working and covered by a company program. That's something you can't ignore. And so this week, we're going to dive deep into this, uh, this problem. And as the government and our leaders debate on how we're going to fund this rising healthcare problem, whether it's Obamacare, Trump care, or whoever the next president's care is, it doesn't really matter. The cost of health care is inflating two to three times faster than everything else. So if you think prices at the gas station are bad, if you think prices of milk and eggs are going up more than normal, health care is inflating two to three times faster than that. And so this ideal financial plan you're creating could eventually steer you into the inevitable, which is... I've got to pay for this. I've got to pay for this. And so my question is, what are your contingency plans around this? And when healthcare is inflating that quickly and people are living longer and longer and longer, uh, not only do you run into spending more money in a short period of time, you could actually end up spending more money over a long period of time. And I see this often. So many people are chasing a rate of return. So many people are looking at the one aspect of money they think matters, which is how big their investments are growing, whether it's their business, their retirement fund, uh, their investments like stock portfolios, etc. Quite frankly, none of that really matters if you're not planning for things to go wrong and what you're going to do. What's the point of building all this up to see it just crash down? And I've said the same thing before when it comes to your taxes, right? Everybody's focused on growing the money and not looking at how they're going to pay taxes on this stuff. Well, I'm going to say with the same passion, what's the point of building all this up to have a health care issue come up that you've got to dump a bunch of money into? It doesn't make any sense. So do you understand Medicare? Do you understand Social Security and how that affects you? If you're like most of the people I meet, the answer is no. All we do is pay attention to the headlines, how people can't agree on a health care program. It doesn't really matter. Why should we try to predict or live our life with the assumption that the government will take care of us when really they probably won't? So I'm going to take a quick break. We're going to go to commercial hear from our sponsors. But when we get back, we're going to go deep into this subject with my guest today, who I think you'll find will shed a lot of light on how you need to approach this issue. Uh, You're listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi on KCAA AM 1050, the station that leaves no listener behind. We will be right back. Okay, welcome back to the show. And at this point, uh, I have the distinct pleasure to invite our first guest to the show. Uh, I recently had a chance to listen to him at a, uh, a conference, and uh, I found the insights he brought on health care and health expenses very powerful, and I think you will too. His name is Dan McGrath. He co-founded Jester Financial Technologies, their website, if you are curious is gesturefinancial.com. What they do is they provide software, resources, and education materials for firms to help investors plan for retirement's biggest expense, which I've already mentioned is health costs. Uh, at Gesture Financial, they believe that if people are properly educated about how health costs will impact them in retirement, they're going to adjust how they're saving today and make uh, tomorrow a lot easier. Uh, for you listeners, there is a free report and more information on how these healthcare costs uh, will impact you, uh, you can go to the website yourretirementcosts.org to get that free report. Uh, But without any further ado, I want to welcome Dan to the show. Good morning. How are you today? Doing well, Daniel. How about yourself? Everything going well? Yes, absolutely. And uh, here at the Financial Wake Up Show, one of the things we want to continue to bring our listeners is education. And I think we should start with a general overview. 
We have heard a lot about healthcare plans in the news. Can you share with our listeners what the current state of healthcare expenses are in the United States and what trends you're seeing? Uh, well, that's a, a wide open and um, it's a wide open question, and it can be interpreted many different ways depending on how it impacts people. Um, an example of what's happening with the Affordable Care Act, many with inside the, the employer side that provide health benefits, you're going to see massive changes. Probably not this year because they will not. Uh, it looks like the repeal of the Affordable Care Act won't happen, but there'll be changes in about a year. But prior to that, you're going to see, unfortunately, and I think all groups that um, are in the healthcare space will agree, we're unfortunately going to see some pain in, in the eyes of uh, higher premiums and higher costs. So unfortunately, that's where we're headed. And then after we go through a little bit of pain and have a little bit of a, a market um, or more of a population, not revolt, but a some anger, you'll actually start seeing true reform within healthcare, especially through the uh, self-employed and employer side. And you're going to start hopefully seeing costs not increase as much. But the sad truth is, healthcare is going to increase year over year. It's now just a question of how, at what rate, can we temper the inflation rate of healthcare? And there's a lot of factors that dictate that. Unfortunately, for all of us, healthcare, unfortunately, will be increasing and will be increasing for the foreseeable future, at the cost of it, at least. Yeah, in fact, uh, can you share with us, particularly those over the age of 60, um, what do healthcare expenses look like today as far as their overall spending and, and how big of a factor is it? It's, um, for, so it, it, it's, a, it's a funny age because for, for people that are 60, they're still... If they're working, they're still covered through an employer plan. If the employer doesn't offer a plan, they have to go into the, the marketplace and purchase a plan until they're 65 and they go on to Medicare. So it's a, it's a tricky age bracket, but unfortunately what ends up happening is healthcare for specifically Americans that are 60 and older, healthcare is the largest expense they're going to face. It's larger than, than any two expenses that they're going to combine. And the reason being is Healthcare is we, we try to educate everyone. Healthcare for a 60 year old may not be their most expensive thing. But as they get older, healthcare is the only expense they can't downsize or they can't forego with. You can't just decide, I'm not going to take my medications, I'm not going to have my eyes checked, I'm not going to go, whatever, whatever ailment you may have, you can't just skip it. So it's not like I can downsize my car, my house, I can trade my car in and get a cheaper car, I, I don't have to go on vacation. I can skip a meal. With healthcare, unfortunately, it's an expense that we all have. And as we get older, and we as a, as a country, our population is getting older, it's just an expense that's going to be the largest expense that we have in our retirement and in our future. And that's the, it's the hard truth that we have to deal with. You know, there's also uh, a segue from that statement, Dan, is, is uh, you mentioned in, in, in uh, just hearing you speak, there's some crossover between uh, and problems between long-term care and Medicare and uh, some of the benefits you can, uh, you know, derive from each of those. Can you share with the listeners some of the problems with that crossover between the two coverages? problem that we have it actually stems from the financial industry, we'll, we'll call it uh, an inadequate education on what the two forms are. Um, they're two totally separate types of coverage. So unfortunately what's happening inside the, the financial industry is many financial advisors that are doing great work and they mean well, there's no ulterior motive, they're trying to do what's best for everyone. There's a perception that long-term care will cover health problems and health ailments. And unfortunately, it, it doesn't. It covers long-term care. It covers the needs if you can't do some, some daily activities like dressing yourself or eating or bathing. And it, it provides the opportunity to get into facilities if you need more care as you get older and become more, uh, I guess we call it, um, more chronic with the needs that you have. Where Medicare which, for the record, I want to be on record of stating Medicare is, if for those that know how to 
use the Medicare system and for those that are properly planning for Medicare, it is arguably the best insurance you could possibly have. Hands down, if used correctly, Medicare is absolutely the greatest insurance that is available. But Medicare does not cover long-term care. It doesn't cover any of those needs. And you can't use long-term care to help get any Medicare. So you basically have, are, are stuck in a... You're stuck in a position as you near retirement that you really need to have both. And unfortunately, the need for Medicare isn't really a need. It's it's mandatory. You don't have a choice. You're, you're going to accept, you're going to enroll in the Medicare. It's the question of how abundant your plan will be. And for long-term care, it's not mandatory. And it's not, I won't say it's, I'll say it's necessary, but it's definitely not mandatory, and it's something that we argue with Jester Financial that if people are in a position to put money away for long-term care and possibly buy a long-term care plan or buy something that provides for long-term care coverage, it's not even up for debate. It has to happen. And ultimately, the reason that has to happen is because where we're headed as a country, we have a very large group population, the baby boomers heading towards retirement, and as they age, their unfortunate health will break down. A lot of people are unfortunately still on prescription drugs. They may not be the healthiest as we once were before. So the, the need for long-term care is going to be there, and unfortunately, um, we don't have a lot of facilities, and we don't have a lot of uh, person power that's going to be able to meet the needs of the baby boomers that have long-term care needs. And Medicare doesn't cover those needs. So they're gonna to have to be able to fund those needs in their own their own personal way. Right. And one of the ways is, is, is the plan, you have to plan for it. And right. it is coming, and for anybody listening, not to go on a, on a huge rant, but for anybody listening, um, we're being told by the federal government through the Department of Health and Human Services, out of the 76, million baby boomers that are currently on the uh, on the face of our country, they can expect to need some form, 70, about 70% 70 of them can expect to see or expect to need some form of long-term care. That's a pretty big number. That's about 53 to 54 million people are going to need some form of long-term care. So the, the need for our economy and the need for people to do it, it's a must. They have to start planning for it. That's a not huge. sure. If I, not sure if I, I I went too deep or went on a tangent, but I'm uh, I'm hoping I, I answered that all right. No, absolutely. That's a huge <laughs> demographic, uh, and and I think people need to hear that. Now, you brought up an interesting case scenario um, that I heard about, where some people may never even receive a social security check after they've enrolled. <laughs> um, oh oh yeah, that's happening. Yeah, tell us tell us a little bit about. Uh, that important Social Security election and how Medicare plays into that. <laughs> so the, in order to understand this, we must realize what the, the rules are set up by the federal government. So the first thing people have to realize when they're in retirement is that in order for you to collect or receive your Social Security benefit, by federal law, you have to accept Medicare if, you know, if you're 65 and older and no longer have any health coverage through a credible health health plan. So if you are, say, 65 years old, you're no longer covered by your employer's health plan through, uh, or your spouse's health plan, meaning you have no health insurance, you have no choice. You have to accept Medicare in order to receive your Social Security check. If you do not accept Medicare when you're eligible for whatever reason and you are collecting your Social Security check, you unfortunately will forfeit your current Social Security benefit, plus your future one. And if you were happening to collect Social Security prior to that point, you have to pay back every nickel that you've received from Social Security. Wow. So you have no choice. You have to accept Medicare once you're on Social Security. Now, the issue with, social, with, with Medicare is once you accept it, what people have to start planning for is Medicare is now means-tested. So Medicare, through the Medicare Modernization Act uh, created in Congress, 
they basically have stayed, they basically created what is known as Medicare's income related monthly adjustment amount, but better known as, as IRMA. And all that states is if you happen to be earning more than the a set limit that's created by, believe it or not, Medicare, it's not created by Congress, it's not created by our politicians, it's created by Medicare. And Medicare uses the funds to actually not only fund itself, but also help pay down the deficit or help help go into the general the general fund of the U.S. Treasury. If you happen to be earning too much money that they deem too much money, which is right now eighty five thousand dollars for an individual and one hundred and seventy thousand dollars for a couple, if you're earning over that limit, you're going to pay more for your Medicare premiums. You're going to pay anywhere from forty percent more to two hundred and twenty percent more. Wow. Now. The problem is, you pay for your Medicare premiums through your Social Security check. So what, what what's what's missing within the financial industry is they they address Social Security planning extremely well, but what they're not showing when they address the Social Security issue is they're not showing that Medicare premiums are automatically deducted from your Social Security check. Now, this wouldn't be a problem, but unfortunately, Social Security, when you have a year-over-year -year cost of living adjustment, or better known as COLA, when you receive your COLA, the COLA is not keeping up to the same inflation rate as Medicare. Right. So we saw a perfect example in 2016 to 2017, the Social Security COLA cost of living adjustment for people was 0.3%. It was on average $5 per person. <laughs> But what ended up happening is Medicare inflated at only 10.2%. Wow. So that increased by 12. This is on a monthly basis. Right. So people didn't receive a cost of living adjustment because it went to their Medicare credit. Now, thankfully, these people didn't, most people didn't lose money from their Social Security check. They just remained level because of this provision called the Hold Harmless Act. And what this act states, and it was created in 1984, it simply states that no retiree can see a reduction in Social Security benefits due to an increase in Medicare Part B premiums. So, example, Medicare inflated by $12, Social Security checks only went up by 5 everyone's Medicare premiums only increased by $5. It can't go any higher because everyone was held harmless. The problem is, if Medicare premiums are, are going to go up again, and it looks like they're going to go up about 16%, from 2017 to 2018, all the information we're gathering now shows us that healthcare is going to inflate by anywhere from 16 to about 48 percent, give or take. And hopefully, it doesn't. Hopefully, the we can figure something out before October. And the reason why we say October is that's when open enrollment is for Medicare. Right. So what will, what will happen is, let's say Medicare is at 134 dollars a month today. In 2017, if it increases to let's just make an even number, it increases to 150 a month. People that were held harmless still owe the difference from 150 to 134 into where they're at. So let's say everyone stayed at 120 just for math. They owe the $30 still from 2017 to 2018. So even if their Social Security check goes up and increases, they're still not going to see an increase because they're going to take that increase and they're going to pay it back to. To Medicare. So the, for the majority of Americans, they're never going to see their Social Security check increase. It's just not going to happen in the near future. Now, where people are going to lose their Social Security check, this is where it becomes a little bit trickier. We mentioned the Medicare Irma brackets, the income-related adjust adjustment amount. What Congress did in 2009 is they went ahead and they changed this whole Harmless Act. And they stated that for anyone that has too much income that reaches these IRMA brackets, they're no longer afforded the protection of the Affordable Care, I mean, of the uh, Whole Harmless Act. So they can actually see their Social Security check reduced. Man. So now, if we just tag Social Security, on, if we just take a look at the known variables, Social Security is telling us that the, the most the cost of living adjustment is going to be is 2.6% for the foreseeable future. We also know, because Medicare tells us, that the lowest inflation rate that Medicare will inflate at is 5.78%. Now, how they're going to be able to keep that 5.78% inflation rate that low is if they can cut the reimbursement rates to the healthcare providers 
by, I believe, as much as 40%. And if they can also impose a $3 a month surcharge on every Medicare beneficiary. If they can do those two things, Medicare will only inflate at 5.78%. If they cannot, Medicare has to inflate at a higher rate. Right. So even if, yes, so even if we keep Medicare at a 5.78% inflation rate, with Social Security at a 2.6% COLA, and they both increase, once you factor in these Medicare uh, surcharges for income, or EARMAS charges for income, anyone that enters that bracket within a certain period of time, it's, it's about, on average, it's about between 8 and 12 years, their Social Security check will not be able to pay for their Medicare premiums. That's... So what will happen is they will, they will enroll in Social Security, they will enroll in Medicare, their Social Security check will be completely consumed by Medicare premium. Then they're going to have to write a check to the federal government for what Social Security didn't cover for Medicare premiums. And then the unfortunate sting is those same very people that lost their Social Security check are going to be taxed on the income of Social Security they've never received. That is mind-blowing. That is it's, absolutely mind-blowing. And the, the, the frustrating part, because we've, we've been screaming at Congress now for the last six years saying something has to be done, not only is Congress not listening, but unfortunately when you take a look at the financial industry, there isn't, there isn't a firm, and, and we ask this question whenever we speak, is there a financial firm helping people plan for this? That's, a, good, that's a very good question. I, so what's great is there are there are wonderful individual financial advisors, we call them independents, that are aware of the situation and they're doing the best work that they can, but it's literally hand to hand combat and they're they're sole people taking on an army. So there's only so much that they can do. So what we're trying to do is bring an awareness to not only the financial industry, we're trying to bring an awareness to the you know the, the United States, the population of here's this problem. It was unfortunately set up by law. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but these are the rules and the regulations. We have to plan for it. And the problem is, if Medicare decides to change these rules, Medicare will not have enough money in its trust fund by 2025 to continue. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So that's, because here's the big problem. We know there are 76 million baby boomers out there, and the right. 76 million baby boomers are, are, are the, the bulk of the breadwinners. They're earning the highest income. They're also spending the most amount of money, so they're generating the most tax revenue. So when you take a look at where they're headed, we're going to know that their income is going to come down a little bit because they're not going to be working and they're going to be retired, and the spending will most likely have to dry up, so the tax revenue is going to dry up. The problem that we face in the United States, and this is the first time it's going to happen in the history of the, of the United States, is the generation that's following the baby boomers, which is Generation X, is now smaller than the baby boomers. Mm. So how does a smaller group, Generation X, makes up about 62 million people, how are 62 million people going to afford the benefits or the entitlements of Social Security and Medicare to the baby boomers? while also still funding the federal government. Right. We have and, the millennials, uh -huh. and thankfully they're big, and we have immigration, and that's a, another conversation, but with immigration, illegally and legal, they're about 90 million. But the problem that we face, and what we've, we've brought up numerous times, is the millennials have two giant strikes against them, and it's not their fault. The first one is the amount of income that they're earning their pay grade, when adjusted for inflation, is not at the same level or the same rate as the baby boomers. Right. They're not earning as much. The other problem is the majority of millennials have tacked on so much debt through college education mm -hmm. and, and furthering their education that they're actually the, the they're the I and mean, you could argue the history of the world, they are the generation that has set that has battled themselves with the most amount of debt any generation has ever done. Right. So we have a huge problem. So if Medicare decides to change these income rules, unfortunately Medicare will not be able to sustain itself. 
So this problem is here to stay. It's just now a question of will somebody in the financial industry pick up the torch and start helping people plan for it? Mm -hmm. That is just remarkable stuff. And uh, for those of you listeners, you, you know I've harped on this quite a bit as far as the importance of healthcare planning as well as the fact that people are living longer. Uh, which which even compounds the issues you're talking about, Dan. Now you're a oh, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say just agreeing with you without a doubt. Yeah, Long, longevity is not our friend right now. That's right. That's right. Now you're a third party. You provide education, technology, and resources to firms in this space. But you have a very strong opinion on annuities, and personally, <laughs> I've seen uh, annuities. The demand for them spike in recent years, probably due to those 78 million baby boomers moving into retirement and needing some security there. Um, tell us your opinion on on annuities and how that plays into this Medicare discussion. <laughs> so it's um, it, it's, more, it's I, I guess you'd call it even more of a, an opinion as I'm more of a zealot. Uh, we argue, and I argue personally, and my firm argues, and everyone's part of the firm. Everyone has to have an annuity. Everyone. And it's not up for debate. It's not up for a challenge. Unfortunately, the hard pill for a lot of people to swallow is the fact that for the good of the U.S. economy, everyone in the country is going to need another form of guaranteed income. Now, the reason being is the example of people losing their Social Security check. Mm -hmm. So we highlight the fact that on average, so let's say somebody is not impacted by Medicare's income-related adjustment amount, the IRMA, so no one's paying extra for their Medicare premiums. They're just going to pay the standard rate. The average person is going to see Social Security, their benefit, be consumed by about 40% by Medicare premiums. Mm. So now think of this. You have 76 million baby boomers heading towards retirement. We know that for a majority of Americans, they say it's 50, uh, Social Security has come up with a survey, 54% of all retired uh, individuals, or, I'm sorry, all retired couples, and 73% of all retired individuals rely on Social Security to be their, be 50% of their overall household income. Now, what's going to happen is as they age, and healthcare, unfortunately, is going to become more and more expensive, and the reason being it's going to become more and more expensive is, is the simple mathematics of we have an aging population, 76 million baby boomers heading towards retirement. We don't have enough people to take care of them. It's the, a supply and demand thing. Healthcare has to go up. It's, right. it, it's just, it's, it's economics 101. So we know the healthcare is going to increase by so much that you're going to have the bulk of Americans lose their only form of guaranteed income or lose a, a very large portion of their guaranteed income. So now how do they stay in front of inflation? How do they continue to pay their bills? How do they continue not to need public aid? Well, they need another form of guaranteed income. And we, we have the running joke, and I'm not, not to bash a particular asset manager that doesn't like annuities. Um, we ask a very simple question. We call him once a week. I believe he's in San Francisco, and we ask a very simple question. Can you provide us a guaranteed form of income for the rest of our lives? And he cannot. There isn't a mutual fund. There isn't, an, there isn't a money management platform that can guarantee us an income for the rest of our lives. That's right. The only, the only product that is out there that can do that is an annuity. Mm -hmm. So for the good of the country, we have to get annuities into people's hands. And they have to be the right annuities. It just can't be any annuity. And each person has a different need, has, has a different lifestyle, has different circumstances. And that's the beauty of annuities. Each company has provides different types of annuities. Mm -hmm. We don't endorse a particular company. We don't endorse a particular annuity. We just want to make sure that everyone has another form of guaranteed income. Right. And, and that's now something. We all, Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. I can't. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, we also argue where annuities may not be the best match for, let's say, somebody that's obviously 25, 30, 35 years old, an annuity is not the best match. Not only are they going to have to take advantage of investments, and certain key investments we argue is a loss, 
but they should also be looking at life insurance as well. And that's another another financial instrument that is being shunned by Wall Street. Mm-hmm. And it, it, we have to get that into people's hands. They have to start planning for this oncoming problem. Yeah, those are points that uh, have resonated very well with the previous shows we've done on those topics. And so it's nice to know that we have a third-party industry leading expert, uh, an educator, that is resonating those same those same points that I'm seeing when working with individual families and businesses. Um, it's it's gesturefinancial.com for you listeners if you want to get more information. And again through the company that Dan has founded, there is a free report uh, and more information on these healthcare costs that you can uh, access through yourretirementcosts.org. Really, really mind-blowing stuff, and and I really appreciate your time this morning, Dan. I hope you have a good rest of the weekend. (laughs) Thank you. It's, uh, we're trying, we're plugging away every, we don't actually like the weekends because we can't work. So, <laughs> well, you're doing a lot of work, I can tell, because number one, I can feel the passion in how you speak, yeah. but also the level and depth of knowledge you've got on this subject is something that we need to disseminate to to our country, as you said, and and uh, to know that by 2025 we could have some funding issues. Uh, that's right around the corner. Um, uh, yeah, and it's actually a lot. It's it's a lot worse. Not to scare your listeners. Um, it's a lot closer. It's not just 2025. The problem is a lot closer because the individual states are paying for, not everyone, but they pay for public employees, retired public employees' health care. So as those rates go up, the state budgets get hit as well. So yeah, not, that you, not to cut you off, but yeah, the, the problem's a lot closer than, than we, you know, even 2025. That's, uh, that's another factor we have to consider in our planning. And uh, again, Dan McGrath, Jester Financial Technologies, uh, we appreciate your time this morning. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, uh, we're going to uh, do our Get More to Get More segment. You're listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi on KCA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. back after that brief word from our sponsors as you all know every week i highlight a nonprofit to end the show and why is that because i don't think you can get more in life without giving more so on this week's give more to get more segment i'm going to welcome pamela lamworth she's the president and ceo of give kids the world village And as president and CEO, she lives those words every day, inspiring a committed family of staff, volunteers, and donors that make the village possible. She's been part of the organization since 1992, and she was chosen to lead the village in 1995. She's responsible for the operations of the village, all the strategic advancement initiatives for the organization as well. Now, prior to joining the village, Pamela spent uh, many years developing a background in resort operations management, human resource development, project planning for 16 years with Walt Disney World. And at Disney, she was involved in everything from casting to park operations to attraction sales. She left Disney in 1993 and uh, was a consultant to the president and CEO of the Hard Rock Cafe in all areas of human resources, organizational development, and strategic planning. She's here to talk about the organization she runs now, Give Kids the World Village. So I'm going to welcome Pamela to the show. Uh, How are you this morning? Wonderful. Thank you, Daniel. Boy, I'm just tired listening to that. You make me sound so old. (laughs) Well, I think the word uh, that would be more apt is very qualified and uh, very impressive. Very blessed. Very blessed. Yes, absolutely. So tell us, what's the mission of Give Kids the World Village? Give Kids World is a nonprofit resort, and the easiest explanation is we're the destination here in Central Florida for all children with life-threatening illnesses whose one wish is to come and experience all the magic that Central Florida has to offer, whether that be meeting Mickey Mouse or visiting SeaWorld, uh, Universal, 
uh, visiting the Wizarding World of Harry Potter or Legoland here. So we partner with all the different wish granting organizations around the world, and we are the destination. So about half of all children who have a wish is to come here. So we are the destination. We provide the accommodations and the meals and um, the attraction tickets and a week-long experience for the wish child and their entire family. Wonderful. And we did have the pleasure of having Make-A-Wish on uh, several episodes ago, so I'm sure you perhaps work with them. Of Absolutely. Yes, great. Now, uh, you've been with the organization since 92, leading mm-hmm. the village since 95. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Give Kids the World Village? Henry Landworth, and he was a hotelier in the area, and just a bit of a background about him. He was born in Belgium, and uh, right before the outbreak of World War II, he and his family moved to Poland. His family's Jewish, so unfortunately he lost his father early in the war, and then Henry and his twin sister Marga were taken to concentration camps, and he spent five years in concentration camps between the ages of 13 and 18. And then, you know, fast forward through many experiences and things, he made his way to Central Florida and was a hotelier, and he happened to own the very first Holiday Inn right side, right outside of the Walt Disney World gate. Hmm. So his would be the hotel that many of these wish granting organizations, most of them make a wish at the time, would call and say, hey, if we could make all the other arrangements, would you be willing to put the family up for free? And of course, he would always say yes. Then he got a call one day that a reservation was canceled. It was a little girl named Amy from Virginia who had lost her battle with leukemia. And time simply ran out because of all the time it took those wish granting organizations to make the arrangements. I see. So Henry said, I think I can streamline that process. And basically he did. So we work with about 240 different chapters of wish granting organizations around the world. Uh, He streamlined the process so if need be, we can bring families down here in less than 24 hours. Um, We get families from all 50 states and 76 countries around the world, and since 1986, have served 153,000 families. That's amazing. 76 countries, 153,000 children served. That is fantastic. Now, what specific? And it's a staggering number, but just to Daniel, if you you to put it into perspective, there's about 27,000 children diagnosed every year with a life-threatening illness just in the United States alone. So, literally, our work is just beginning. Right. That's a staggering number in itself, 27,000 it diagnosed. Now, you provide lodging. What are the specific programs and uh, areas that Give the Kids World Village supports? Well, we have a, an 84-acre village that right now has 168 villas. They're two bedroom, two bed. Everything is completely wheelchair accessible, even the shower. So, you know, when you have a 16-year-old girl who's told you she's never been able to shower before by herself until she got here, it's all of those amenities that make the children recapture their childhood for this one incredible week that's filled with everything from literally life simplest pleasures like ice cream for breakfast. We have um, an ice cream parlor that's open from 7.30 in the morning till 9.30 at night, so kids can have a banana split for breakfast, lunch, dinner, midnight snack if they want. Um, Yeah, and then just a a resort pool complex and fishing, and we bring horses in for horseback riding. We have nightly entertainment. So, again, we celebrate Christmas every Thursday and Halloween every Monday, and we do a village idol program on Wednesday night where the kids get up and perform. So it's anything that we can pack into that week. Um, our whole philosophy is we want to create the happiness that inspires hope. So these children will recapture that that spirit that they can, can go back and renew their battle against their illness. Or in those unfortunate, tragic times, if the child is lost, that the family will have something, some warm memories that they you know will find is hopefully a source of comfort and strength in the years to come. So that's really, you know, what we do is try to create everything that we can possibly do. Of course, they go to all the attractions. The the parks here are extremely generous and provide tickets for the entire family for a week-long experience. We provide the meals, the parties, the the entire experience here. um, The the parks actually send their characters to the village so our families don't have to wait in the long lines to get that all-important picture or autograph of Mickey or... um, you know, Woody Woodpecker was here this morning. The, the, the Sea World sent out some characters and animals. So it's an incredible experience. That's uh, Some of those programs sound fantastic. And having two young children of my own, I, I know that uh, those are the memories that uh, 
that really last and and it's great to hear that you have programs every week to provide these children with those memories now what areas do you all need help how do our listeners get involved you know there's probably three ways that you can assist any nonprofit out there and of course it's first donate second volunteer or third just be an advocate to spread the word and the best source of any information of course is our website which is www.givekidstheworld.org or g and one of the many things we do of course you know being out there we have wonderful folks who volunteer, who um, donate money or items for us, but also volunteering. You know, we are running a 168 villa resort complex. We have about 175 staff members full and part time, but we also fill 1,700 volunteer shifts every week. Wow! And we're so blessed that so many folks from around the country because they want to come here on vacation and they're turning it into a volunteerism experience. And so they come and volunteer with their kids to kind of show we're so, you know, we're so blessed that we get to take this incredible vacation. Let's go and volunteer at a place where the children aren't so um, blessed. And I think it provides a dual kind of support. It's, they get their vacation, but then they're kind of teaching their kids early on to give back. So really it is a donate, volunteer, advocate. And there's so much information on our website that talks about each one of those areas. Yeah. Gosh, I, I wish we had met. I've been to Disney World twice in the last two years, and uh, oh my goodness! I would have. I, I think that would be such a great experience for the for me and the kids and and my wife as well to have contributed. But uh, perhaps next time. Now, donations that go to your cause. Um, it's running the resort itself. I'm sure has a huge overhead. You have a an extensive background in that. What happens specifically to monies that are donated to your organization? Well, we are very blessed. We love to um, expose that. We, I mean, share that we, we, you know, we take care of business while we take care of hearts. And so we have this wonderful, heartfelt mission, but we also run like a business. So we're very proud of the fact that we continue to get Charity Navigator's four star rating. We last year were one of only 49 charities in the entire United States that they rate, they got a perfect score of 100 on all of their criteria that they have. And also that 93 cents of every dollar spent goes directly to the mission and about 6.7 cents to admin and overhead. So we're very, very proud of that. So the money that is donated to us is put to good use actually making and helping us provide this week-long experience for the family. Um, we do partner with all of our witch granting partners. Now, this is completely cost-free to the families. The witch granting organizations do provide um, an admin fee, but then we're responsible for raising all the, the rest of the money. And it's about $17 million a year that we need to raise up to operate the village. And then an additional probably $24 million in in-kind, which includes those tickets and the gifts that we give and anything that we can use. Like, when just imagine, Daniel, you know, we, I tell you that we celebrate Halloween every Monday because mm -hmm. many of these children might not experience the next Halloween. Right. We go through nine tons of candy a year. Oh, my. I mean, really, you don't even want to think about the calories in that. <laughs> but, um, so, and the, you know, we've got wonderful partners, but every day when the children come back from the long day in the park, there's a gift waiting for the children. And everything that we do for the wish tub, we also do for the siblings because they suffer in many ways right alongside the, 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 the wish child. You know, often all of the tension and focus is on that wish child, but sometimes maybe the, witch, the, the siblings feel a little slighted or, you know, sent with babysitters or grandparents or whatever. So we want to make sure that we're bringing that whole family back together. That's so again, the dollars that are raised goes directly to help us fulfill all of these wonderful programs and activities we have. That's, that's amazing work you're doing, Pamela. What, what for you has been the most rewarding aspects of your involvement over the last 20 plus, 20 plus years? Yes. I think the inspiring stories that we hear from our families, from our volunteers. You know, there are so many wonderful charities out there, Daniel, as you all know. There's over a million and a half charities in the United States alone. And many of them, you're just giving money and you're hoping that it's going to find a cure for this or solve this social ill or this social need. And it's by faith and you, you don't really get to see that instant gratification. Here, we're so blessed that we see these families coming after maybe days, months, years of struggle. 
struggles, and these are families much like yours and mine. They have all those outside stresses about making ends meet and, you know, getting the kids to do their homework and brush their teeth and that work-life balance. And then on top of that, they're dealing with a child with a life-threatening illness. So by the time they get here, they're worn out. They're just, this whole new norm of doctor visits and hospitals has just drained them. So, you know, I think that's one of the things to see the families when they first arrive and Many of them haven't traveled before, so they're tired. They don't know what to expect. By the middle of the week, the expression, the lights come back in the children's eyes. And by the end of the week, the only tears you see are that they're so sad that they're leaving. So all of those inspiring stories. And um, I don't know if you've got time for one quick. And we had a little little girl here back in 2001 in December who had stage 3 kidney cancer, a Wilms tumor, who was on her wish because time is, they just said, you know, you need to go if you're going to go because there's nothing else we can do. Well, she went back and told her doctor, if you want to make kids well, don't give them shots anymore. Send them to give kids the world its magic medicine. She just finished her first year in college. Wow. I surprised her last year at her high school graduation. Her dream is to come back one day and take my job. Wow. So those, so when you ask, you know, what is it? What are those rewarding aspects? It's seeing that. And unfortunately, on the flip side, when you see, um, I was having a discussion with a family the other day on the avenue, and their little girl um, has this disease where they know that they're only going to have her for two more years. And they said, what we can't wait for is we know this is inevitable, but we can't wait to come back and volunteer after we no longer have our child with us so that we can relive these memories and pay it forward for everything that you've done for us. You know, with 153,000 families, I could just talk forever, but I think it's those stories and so much more about what it means to the volunteers that we have and the donors that we have and the corporate partners. Um, you know, shame on me if I ever complain about anything because when you hear all these stories, you just feel so remarkably blessed. Right. Um, just very uh, moving stuff and um, really amazing work that, that you all are doing there. I think... Um, I'm hoping you listeners go to the website, givekidstheworld.org, get involved. Um, Pamela, thank you so much for spending some of your Saturday morning with us here in oh, Southern my California. Pleasure. I'm very well spent, and I, I do hope they go to that website. We do have events out in Southern California, too, because a lot of our corporate partners out there. So please just go to the website, and there's regional places where you can find out what's happening in your area. Wow. Or, Daniel, hopefully one day I'll get to meet you and you'll come here and visit with us and bring your family out to volunteer and, and tour the village. I think I might have to uh, fulfill that one day. But uh, I am so grateful that you took the time to share your cause with our listeners today. And I hope you have My a great pleasure. rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. You too, Daniel. All right, Pamela. Bye-bye. Okay, action-packed episode today. Uh, I want to thank both my guests um, every week I talk about, if you have any doubt, just reach out. And we talked about some amazing, uh, information that you should be aware of when it comes to healthcare and social security. And I'll say it again. If you have any doubt, just reach out. Daniel at financialwakeupshow.com. Call me on, off the air, 8507-WAKE-UP. The only thing you're missing out on is more information. Take actions, take steps to better understand this stuff because I am telling you it's just not worth it. Money's not everything. I say that all the time, but money creates opportunity for you to do a lot of things like take care of yourself physically, take care of your loved ones physically, including their health and provide for everything else that you need. So uh, again, every Saturday, I thank you for your listenership. I thank you for the opportunity to share with you my message around this stuff. Uh, until next Saturday, I wish you health, wealth, and prosperity. You've been listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi, KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no one behind. Have a good one.